Go ahead happen with the word. Let's give God praise for his holy word. It's going to be good, though. It's going to be good. Praise the Lord. Amen. This white mic has been doing some things lately, but we're going to check it out and have, to, have that one on standby. Just have it on standby. I'm going to try. I like the way you have it eq but it's been, you know, kind of gurgling here and there, but we're going to pray over it in the name of Jesus. Believe that it's going to be right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We bless you. We praise you. We glorify you. We thank you for this wonderful service that we have had so far. We've been praying all week, and uh, we have believed and spoken that everybody who was supposed to be here under the sound of my voice today would be here, and that's who we are and where we are. So now we loose your spirit to have his will and have his way in with and through me and in the people for this very important message. And we believe that it will be the truth spoken in love and that we're going to leave better than we came. And let every soul say, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus I, shall receive, I shall receive, I shall believe, I shall believe and I shall walk in what I'm taught to the glory of God. Now, here's how faith works. We praise God before the message because we believe that we receive. So let's praise him now. Amen. That's how faith, this is how faith works. Amen. You are, you give it, oh, are you, that's all you got out of the message? That was all you got? Oh, come on. You can do better than that. We praise the glory. Thank you. Woo. Oh, I tell you, we got to take some lessons from the world. I tell you, the world, they, they be going crazy when that team comes out and stuff, man. I'm telling you. Anyway, in the book of uh, Galatians chapter number five, in the book of Galatians chapter number five, we're going to look at our foundation text for the series that we're in, and let us read it together. Let's read together. Verse number 17, 517. Oh, by the way, um, I don't know if you all noticed, but I've been sharing my notes with you. Has anybody noticed that lately? Yeah. Well, guess what? For the days I'm going to share these notes with you. And you can take some notes, too, but you're going to have my notes, too. Isn't that nice? Somebody say, thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. All right, here we go. Let's read together. For the flesh fights against the spirit. Are y'all reading with me? Let's try it again. Let's do this again. For the flesh fights against the spirit, and the spirit fights against the flesh. And these are contrary to to one another. All right, now we get it. Church, I'm teaching from the Life Building Life Blessing Life Changing uh, series entitled Fight Right. Fight Right. Can you say that with me? Fight, Fight right. right. I'm telling you, that's a, that, that, that'll preach, and that's why I'm preaching it. All right, we're going to have a little review. The review is that last week we learned that because God gave us a will, and he called us to uh, take dominion over the earth, there is a fighter in each and every one of us. In other words, there's a fighter in you. Some of y'all already know that, right? But, 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 somebody say but. The key thing was we learned last week that even though there's a fighter in you, don't fight God. Just because you know how to fight I mean, just because, you know, you're from the hood. I mean, just because just you uh, <laughs> know how to fight, don't fight God. Amen? Amen? And don't do what? Don't fight one another. That's, 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 you know, that's the devil's plan. He wants you to fight God, and he wants you to fight one another. But instead of doing that, do what? Fight the devil. Amen. Fight him. So that's the review from last week. Now let's go on to lesson number two. Here we go. Lesson number two is entitled Fight Pride. Fight pride. Oof. All right. Ushers lock the doors. <laughs> Ooh-wee. Here it is. I say it's going to be the truth, but it's going to be in love. It's good. This is going to be, you know, sometimes we think that the best messages we hear are the ones that just have us shouting and clapping and and ooh, he just encouraged me so much. Oh, I was so encouraged. You know, like that message when I talked about think big and speak big and walk big. You know, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking big, I'm talking big, I'm walking big. I mean, that's, those are great messages. But I'm here to tell you that some of the most important messages that you ever have don't have a shout to them. Yeah. 
So it's okay if y'all don't shout too loud. I just want you to get this because this is a very important message. It's like it's like medicine. You know, it may taste bitter going down, but boy, it does the trick. So here we go. Point number one in, in, in this lesson called Fight Pride is we must understand that we have pride. We must understand that we have pride. Now, I know some of us are like, well, I can tune out on this message because I'm, I'm one of those really humble, mellow people and everything. Well, uh, everybody has pride. Everybody has pride. In fact, uh, sometimes you can you can actually how can I state this? Uh, there's a there's a false humility that is equivalent to pride. In other words, if you say I'll give you a perfect example of, of, of pride, which is known as false humility. Uh, if you say things like, "Well, I I just." Um, you know, I'm just a shy, introverted person, and I really, I, I, I just can't talk to people about God. That's pride. You say, Pastor, that's not pride, that's humility. It's false humility. Because anything God says you can be or can do, and if you disagree with it, you're telling him that you know better than him. That's pride. If you say, I can't, I'm just telling you, I can't, I, I can't remember not a scripture, not a one. That's pride. Because the Lord said that you can meditate day and night and make your way prosperous. Come on now. That, if you, if you, you might think that you're being humble. But whenever your will is against God's will, that's pride. Come on, somebody. Amen. Point number one, we must understand that we have pride. Pride, let's see what pride is. Pride is a feeling of pleasure or satisfaction because of one's achievements, qualities, or possessions. In other words, people get really excited or prideful about what they have or what they've achieved or who they are. And let's face it, people get very proud about uh, you know, their degrees. People get very proud about the size of their house. People get very proud about how much money they got in the bank account. Come on, somebody. Amen. They're proud about their positions. Amen. But, but, but uh, see, it, and so everybody has pride. And, but the key thing is we have pride because God made us in his image and likeness. God is the greatest. Amen? Amen. What does the psalmist say? God is great and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. In other words, it's without limits. You can, you can study God from now to forever and still not get to the end of his greatness. Amen? Because he has no end. So he made you in his image and in his likeness. In other words, God made you a spirit with an intellect and gave you a will. Now, I, I, the, the Bible says that man was made on the same day as the beast of the field. That was the sixth day, right? But notice, even though we were made on that same day, there's a whole lot of difference between us and the beast of the field. Now, they have some studies that talk about the intelligence of, of uh, chimpanzees, etc. But let's face it, a chimpanzee has, has, is nowhere near where you are. You, you, turn your next to you. You, you are made in the image and likeness of God. Do you realize what that's saying? He did. I mean, we up here looking at you can you can study the animal kingdom and each and every species and each and every animal has some really awesome things about it. You 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 can study the hummingbird and realize how that thing can fly and yet be stationed and hover. They they you know they they try to figure that out in the military. With the, yeah, the, the, what do they call them, the ospreys? ospreys? The ospreys, a plane that you know can hover. It's not a helicopter or a plane, but it's, it's like a combination of two. But, but that hummingbird can do that, and it's an awesome creature. But it's nothing compared to you. You can spend the rest of your life just studying your eye. I'm going to change this out. It is acting up. And you can just study the eye and all the intricacies of your eye and realize how awesome you are. Somebody say amen. 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 All right, now listen. Listen. 
we have pride because God made us in his image and in his likeness. In other words, we're proud that we're like God. Now, if you don't think that we're proud uh, to be like God, then you need to study your Bible because if you go back to Genesis chapter 3, what you'll find out is that that's where everything jumped off. That's where the devil came and, and started a, a conversation with man or Eve, uh, to be more accurate about it. But he addressed the issue of whether or not they were like God. He said, if you eat this forbidden fruit, God didn't tell you that you're going to be like God. Well, you know, anytime the devil's talking, he's what? Lying. lying. When his lips are moving, he's what? Lying. lying. So he was lying. Amen. You said, well, what do you mean he was lying when he said they'd be like God? They weren't going to be like God if they grew? No. They were going to, they were going to, they were already like God. Thank you for that amen. I said they were already like God. Amen. Genesis 126. God made man in his image and in his life. They were already like God. The devil was trying to get them to disobey God. And the, and the, the fruit of eating that bad fruit, that prohibited, forbidden fruit, was going to be that it was going to make them not like God. They were already like God because before they ate the forbidden fruit, they were holy. And God is holy. Do you see? So, so what I'm trying to tell you is, uh, it, is a, it is a good kind of pride, if you will, to be like God. It really is. And you need to know, uh, we were at this event last night and I was telling them this. I said, you, the, the thing that God gave us that he didn't give the animals he gave us the ability to speak. And do you realize how important that is? When you speak, you're acting like God. Because God spoke everything, what? Into existence, Into existence by his word. word. And guess what? The life that you live right now, whether you like it or not, is all a result, a reflection of what you've been speaking You don't like it, change what you're saying. Really? Change what you're speaking. Because whatever you're speaking, God, listen, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now listen to this. And those that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Whatever you speak, and that's what you eat. You you eating what you cooking. Don't blame it on nobody else. Where the white man, where the, and all this, where the brown, oh boy, come on black people, y'all need to stop this. Well, you know, the brown people, the brown people, they, they, they're taking over. The last time I looked, nobody determined your destiny but you and God. Amen. Hey, I, I mean, why are you worrying about somebody else? Focus on you. God has a plan for you. Did you hear what I'm saying? He has a plan for you. And whatever is for you, all you have to do is take that mouth that he gave you and agree with God. In the beginning, God said, you're like me. In the beginning, the devil said, no, you're not. You need to eat this fruit to be like him. But the lie was that fruit would make you like him when they were already like him. And when they ate that fruit, they would actually become unlike him. The fruit changed them to become sinners. They were not sinners. They were holy. They were filled with love. They were filled with holiness. And when they disobeyed God, that's when all the problems happened. People walk around here during COVID talking about, why is all this stuff happening? You don't know the Bible. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to prove it to you. Somebody say, show it to us, Pastor. I'm glad y'all asked me to do that. Okay, point number one was we must understand we have pride. Everybody has pride. Even the person that says they're humble. You know, I'm the humblest person in the world, and I'm proud of it. <laughs> okay, anyway. Come on, come on. Number two, we must understand the danger of unbridled pride. Oh. Oh, we must understand the danger of unbridled pride. So, so it's all right to be proud to be like God. And you need to say it. You need to say that I am a child of the Most High God. 
I am, say it with you, say, I am made in the image and likeness of God. I am a spirit. I have an intellect. And I have a will. And emotions. Amen. That's like God, right? All right, now watch this. But, but there's a, but see, and I've taught this before, and you got to get this. We have a will, and we call it free will. It is free will, but here's the catch. It's not what? It's not unlimited will. It's free. It's free. It was given to you freely, but it's not. It's not unlimited or sovereign will. God's will trumps your will. God, God doesn't ask you, uh, uh, we, you know, God, God doesn't ask you when you want to be born into this earth. God didn't ask you what family you wanted to be uh, born into. Amen. You know that saying that they have, there's the family that you inherit and the family that you choose. You know what I mean? There's a family that you got birthed into. And then there's a family as you get older, you say, well, this, I like these people, I'm choosing them or whatever. But you didn't make that choice about who was your mom and your daddy. Even if your daddy was a rolling stone, it, 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 every way he laid his hat was on. No matter, but it, it, you didn't choose that. But God chooses your path and, and your life and your journey. And you look at it and may think, oh man, I wish I'd been born with a silver spoon in my mouth. He said, hey, I have a real good plan for you. You just got to agree with me. Now, here we go. We must understand the danger of unbridled pride. Even before God created the earth, unbridled pride, listen, 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 here's the big, big, big news of the day, breaking news, unbridled pride was the very first sin. Listen to me very carefully. I know you think that the first sin was eating the forbidden fruit. I know we say apple, but the Bible doesn't say it was an apple, it just says fruit. But anyway, you think the very first sin, that was, that was man's first sin. But the first sin happened in heaven. And that and it was it was it was uh committed by who? Satan. By Satan. And what was that sin? It was unbridled pride. All right, now let me prove to you. Notice I said unbridled pride. Because there's nothing wrong with you being created in the image of God. Listen, a lot of people have uh great gifts. Did you hear my hear my wife sing? Oh, that's I wish I could sing like that. I mean, you know, I can Okay, well, anyway, the point is, the point is, she was given this gift to sing, and praise the Lord, she doesn't have the big head about it. Did you hear the young man playing earlier on the piano? He's gifted to play and sing. That was a blessing, huh? But, but see, so in and of itself, it's not bad that you have appreciation and exuberance and pride that God bless you like that, but, but just don't get... Don't get too big headed about it. Don't let it be unbridled. Unbridled means unchecked. All right, so here we go. The original sin was unchecked, unbridled pride, and let me prove it to you. Ezekiel chapter number 28. This is a good, this is like a Sunday sermon slash Bible study, because a lot of y'all need to, some of y'all may never go into the book of Ezekiel, but you need to go there today to see, to see this for yourself. And I like to put the scriptures up on the uh, board, so you can really look at it. Look what it says, verse 14. It says, you were the anointed cherub who covers. Who's he talking about? Satan. Talking about Satan. God is talking about Satan. See, this is important. You got to understand how all this stuff, where did it come from? He, he, God is saying, you were the anointed cherub or, or angelic being who covered. I established you. So God, God, watch this. God created Satan. Are we together? Yeah. How is Satan going to be greater than God if God created him? Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. He said, I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. Oh, my goodness. In other words, you were there at my throne. He says, you walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. Verse 15. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. That's a very interesting uh, verse of scripture, is it not? Amen. How can, now listen, if, you, if you're being honest with yourself, this is a big question there. How can he be per perfectly created 
and then in it would he be found in him. Are you are you understanding the yeah. dilemma there? Yeah. If 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 Satan was well, obviously he was beautifully created, and he says you were perfect in all your ways until iniquity was found in you. Well, what, like they said, what had happened? What happened? You know what happened? Pride got got out of check. Got got out of balance. Got got blown up. About a, a, a bound above and beyond proportion. In other words, in other words, here's the key: God made the angels. Satan was an angel. He made the angels and man with a will, with free will. So the angels have free will. And if you don't believe it, you read the book of Revelation. You find out. I believe it's Revelation chapter 13. You find out that when when Satan got kicked out of heaven, a third of the angels went with him. Because, see, now, here's the key. Well, if God is so smart, why didn't he just avoid all that? He could have avoided that. Just don't give Satan a will. And don't give us a will. How would you like to have the will? If you didn't have a will, what would you be? A robot. Talk about, I really love the Lord. You don't have any other choice. If you don't have a will, you don't know nothing else. You're just going to love the Lord. God was so brilliant that he said, in order for that, he's, God is two things. He's holy and he's love. He said, in order for me to create somebody who, who, who ex, ex, experiences and exuberates true love, they have to have a will. Because if you don't have a will, you can't have true love. If you don't have a will, and you don't have more than one choice, there is no true love. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Baby, I love you. I love you with all my heart. I love you more than anybody in the whole world, Eve. It'll come to, it'll come to you in a minute. She was the only woman in the world. Who else you gonna love? Just let Sally May come around here and then we're going to see who you love. You, you talking about you? Yeah, I love you, God. I love you, God. God said, God said, I'm going to create Satan. So you have a choice. Now I'm going to see if you, and Satan is going to appeal to your pride. Now we're going to see if you really love me. Are y'all hearing me today? Okay, now, now let's, go, let's go on with this. So we said, Point number one was, we must understand that we all have pride. Point number two was, we must understand the danger. Somebody say, danger. Sound <laughs> like that song, danger. The danger of unbridled pride. Satan was the first one who let his pride blow up his head, and it happened because he had a will. And he says he was fine. From the day he was created, he was perfect until, until iniquity or sin was found in you until you let your pride just allow you get the big head. Now watch this now. Watch this. Let's slip to Isaiah chapter 14. You say, well, what does that mean when he said unless, unless until iniquity was found in you, I'm going to show you what he meant. Isaiah picks up the rest of the story. He's going to actually lay it out so that you can see how Satan's pride just went Aside, it just it just went unbridled. Look what happened. Isaiah 14 and 13. What I'm getting ready to read you is there's there's uh, <coughs> two verses, but in the two verses, count them, there's five wills. Five times it's gonna say, I will. See about those words? Look what Satan did. He said, For you have said, Isaiah 14, 13, he said, For you have said in your heart, whoo. In your heart. That's that's the center of your being. That's who you really are, what you really think. He says, Satan, you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. That's one. Somebody said, one. one. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Two. Two. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. Three. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. Four. I will be like the most high. <laughs> what? I created you. I created you. 
And you going to come up to me and tell me that you're going to run heaven? Uh -oh. That you're going to take my place? That's like you tell him to, your child, you know, hey, I burdened you, and you're going to come up in here and slap your mama? Well, whoa, we got to. I'll be you y'all better y'all better call who you call? Y'all better call LA County. You better call family, sir. Call the Popo, call everybody. Cause something brother, something get ready to happen up in here. You know, oh no, they gonna have to take me up out of here. Uh-uh. No, no, no. We don't play that up in here. I'm not talking about I'm not talking about provoking your children. I'm talking about the kind of disrespect that is going on right now from child to parent. From child to parent, I was I was looking at this movie, and uh, ooh, this movie's so good. I, I now you know when Pastor recommends a movie, yeah, I ain't playing. I, I have to. This is a highly recommended movie I just saw recently. It's called Noah's Ark, and it was done in 2015 by uh, some British people. And I'm telling you, that movie was so good it brought tears to my eyes. It was so good. But anyway, y'all get a chance to see it. It was on a Roku channel, but however you find it, trust me, you want to see this movie. But but the greatest part in the whole movie was when the mama had to had to chastise the sons. Talk about you because they said your daddy, your daddy done gone crazy. Daddy gone wild. He gone crazy. Talk about some ark and talk about rain. He gone crazy. And the, and the boys was like, we ain't helping him. And the, the mother had to get and say, how dare you? You don't, you don't know the Kool-Aid or the flavor. You realize how many times this man was, has done for you and you won't help him? What? This, see, see, see. All them, all them diapers that, that were changed, all the butts that were clean, all the, all the things that we did when you were a little kid, and you gonna come up here in my house and tell me that you know call me out of my name and threaten me? Oh, they better take the, take me, Jesus, right now. Just go on, take me, because I'm, I'm, I'm about to catch a case up in here. Y'all can just, I'm, I, don't, I don't know who I'm talking to, but, 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 but. I'm just trying to get a picture here of how God must have felt when the devil said five times, get back, God. I'm God. That was the epitome of pride. Now, I'm going somewhere with this. Here's the key. Satan's unbridled pride. Listen now. You may say, what does this got to do with me? He says Satan's unbridled pride. Here's the point. Satan's unbridled pride led to man's two greatest sins two greatest problems. And here's the, here's the little secret. Every person, every man has the same problems. Whew. Man, here's this, this is it right here. You, this just blows the uh, therapist and everybody else away, man. Save you a whole lot of money on the couch. Everybody has the same two problems. Turn your name and say, you too. You and they are pride and lust. Those are the two problems of all men. Pride and lust. So the first sin was pride, and Satan, knowing that, had he did he was like he was like Cain, who couldn't fight God, but he killed, you know, God's son. So Satan couldn't fight God, so he said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get Adam to be killed. I can't I can't be God. I said all this, I would, I would do this, I would do that. He was selling a lot of wolf tickets, but he couldn't he couldn't be God. And God said, You will go to hell, that's what you will do. That's where you're going. So, so, so he said, okay, cast me out of heaven. I'm going to get your son. And I'm going to give him the same sin that I committed, which is pride. I'm going to tell him, go on and eat that fruit. Because the day you do it, you're going to be like God. He told Eve first, and Eve got all excited. The Bible says she started looking at the fruit. Mm, boy, you know, you know, before you purchase, you start looking. You start before you before you go out here and you start shopping and buying all this stuff for Christmas and end up bankrupt. You you be looking at them, you know, online just to keep looking and keep looking. And then all the people say, "Oh, you can you can buy this on sale." Well, that's good if you got the money, but don't 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 hurt yourself. Amen. Amen. I'm just saying, don't hurt yourself. Come up in 2024 talking about in the name of Jesus, I, I'm believing for debt cancellation. <laughs> All these credit cards are coming down. Why'd you get them that high in the first place? 
Should have been praying all that puffing and saying that before. In the name of Jesus, I bind pride. I know that right now I can't afford that. So in the name of Jesus, I'm going to give some people some Christmas cards, a hug, and a smile. Um, hallelujah. It's going to be all right. Give God some praise. It's going to be all right. You, ain't got to, you, don't have to, you don't have to go into debt to prove you love somebody. Really, I'm just being honest with you. Okay, let's get back to this. Satan's unbridled pride led to man's pride and lust. Our two greatest sins are pride and lust. You say, Pastor, where is that in the Bible? 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. It says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it is of the world. In other words, this is everybody's problem. Pride and lust. That's it. Now, you can, you can break them into subcategories and all this other stuff, but at the end of the day, we get into problems because of our pride and our lust. Our pride and our lust. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Now watch this. Unbridled pride leads to excessive self-exaltation and eventual failure or destruction. Unbridled pride. In other words, because of this pride element that's on the inside of us, if it's not checked, then destruction is coming. That's why people, they, they worry about politicians and all that. Oh, they, 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 they're getting away with everything. They're going to get away. No, they're not. The Bible says they're not. Let's read this. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. It's like sow and reap. It doesn't make you happen when you think, but you keep you keep being prideful and let, let, let me put some bones on this so I can really help you understand. Okay, let me let me make sure we really understand. For example, we've got uh, leaders now who won't apologize for anything. Oh no, I didn't do anything wrong. Oh no, I'm doubling down. I don't apologize for nothing. You'll never hear me apologize. That's what they say. And what's, what's happening is the pride is just going out of control. And the Bible says you may not see the result of it in a day or a week, but just keep watching. Just keep watching. And I'm not saying that I haven't been guilty of it. I have. I have. And we all have. But here's the difference. When God, see, see, pride, if you if you study out the, the original definition for it in the Hebrew, it explains that pride is like a it's like a fog. The best way I can say it is pride is like a here's the way the Holy, Ghost, the Holy Ghost gave it to me this past week. Pride is like a blind spot. In fact, thank you, Holy Ghost. This is what you've been trying to show me. This has just been happening the last few days. Now, I got a car, and you know, this technology is pretty cool. I got a car, it's fairly new, it's 2021, so not that old, right? And it has the technology in there, Brother Eric, where, the, where if I look in the side mirrors, not only can I look in the side mirrors, but somebody figured out that even with those side mirrors, there's a what? Blind. A blind spot. And particularly with SUVs, because of the way they're built. But the technology, is such that now the little uh, little icon comes up and in red, and it says cars over there. It's over there. It does everything but says cars over there. I think they need to say that too. But anyway, <laughs> the thing is, over. but do you know what's been happening to me? My wife just stepped out, but she'd be a witness. It's good she stepped out. She, she'd be talking about, amen, amen. <laughs> just happened to me last night. She said, honey. Don't you see that car? And I said, no. I, I, I'm like, what is going on? It, I, is it that my, I, my side mirrors weren't adjusted great? And then it seemed like the little red icon came on just a little too late. Almost hit the car. Because I had a, here she comes. <laughs> and as we move on to the next point, no, I'm just kidding. I had a blind spot. 
I couldn't see the car. I really, listen, I had side view mirrors. The tech, you know, little, little, what do you call that thing? Come on. Huh? Sensor, thank you. Thank you, Christina. The sensor came on. So I had the side view mirrors, the sensor, but that wasn't enough. I got to get the fourth person of the, of, the, of the Godhead telling me, the car, the car, did you see the car? The car's right there. It was on my side. <laughs> How are you going to crash this? You know, that's, now that's my wife right there. She's funny. She's funny. She always tells me, she always warns me if we're going to get, an ac get into an accident, if the car's on her side. And I'm like, well, honey, if the thing hits us, we all go down. But it's my side. <laughs> listen, listen, listen. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. What am I trying to say? We all have what? Blind spots. That's what pride is. Pride is when you can't see that you're being overly prideful. Pride is, okay, let me, I, I, here, I'll give you a better example. Here, maybe, well, another example. Who remembers David? David, uh, David had wives, plural. He was the king. He had everything. But one day, he decided, you know, it's it been out, won a lot of battles and everything else. He decided not to go out to the battle when he was up there on the rooftop, you know, at his big mansion. And he's looking out the window and, woo! He sees this fine woman bathing out there. Women, don't y'all be bathing out there on the, on the, uh, on the terrace or whatever. Anyway, he sees this woman bathing out on the terrace and brother man just loses it. And he's the king. So he can do whatever he, he can summon anybody he wants to the palace. And he summoned her and Long story short, he took advantage of this woman. And then the woman, Bathsheba, gets pregnant, right? Come on, Bible students, right? And now he's got a problem. Oh, my God, because she's married. And her husband is a soldier in the army fighting a war that David should have been at. And he knows that if he doesn't do something, it's only a matter of time before the husband comes back and sees this baby, and he knows it ain't his because he hasn't been home. So David, is, he's, he's thinking, he's thinking, he's thinking, he's pacing, he's like, what am I going to do, what am I going to do, what am I going to do? And he said, ah, I got it. I'm going to bring the soldier Uriah back from the fighting, from the, the war, and I'm going to lay everything out for him. He's wine and song and music so he can be with his wife and then he, and, and sleep with his wife. And then he'll think it's his child. But see, when you do wrong, nothing comes out right. <laughs> Here come the man home, come home and he think he's going to be with his wife. Anybody naturally would want to be the wife. He says, oh, no. Oh, no, King David. I just, in my conscience could not lie with my wife when all my fellow soldiers are out there fighting in the war. I, I would just, I'll just lie here outside the bedroom, but I won't go in to sleep with my wife. And David's like, the devil is a lie. What are you doing? <laughs> Get with your wife. So, so he, he, he can't make it work. So then finally, his pride tells him, I got to kill this guy. I gotta get rid of him because he's gonna he's gonna ruin my whole ki kingdom. Everybody's gonna know that I did him wrong. So he said, "But I can't do it myself. I do like the mafia. I send somebody else so we have a buffer, <laughs> and they won't blame it on me." So he puts a letter in the man's hand and tells him to give it to the you know the commanding officer. He, and, the, and, the, and the man didn't. He's so honest. You're right. So honest. He doesn't even read the letter. He doesn't even know that the letter has his death warrant in the letter. The letter is telling his commanding officer to put him on the front line where the hottest fighting is so he could be killed. And of course, he is killed. He's killed. And now David, he's so happy. Because what? He got, he got the husband out the way, and now he got the woman all to himself. And he thinks he's in the clear. 
Until what? Until God sends the prophet. God will always send the prophet to tell you about your blind spot. He said, David, let me tell you a story. He says, yeah, tell me a story. He said, I'll tell you a story about this great landowner. And he had all the flocks. He had all the sheep and everything. And he said, ooh, he sounds like a good guy. He sounds like me. Mm -hmm. And he said, now, he said he had a neighbor. And, a little, and the neighbor had only one sheep. One little sheep. And then the man went and took that sheep and made it for his own. And David thought about this. And what? The man went and took the man's only sheep and made it his own sheep? What kind of man is that? He said, that man ought to be punished just severely. And the man said, well, David, uh, you the man. <laughs> How is it that David could hear that story and not know that he was talking about him? Well, how was it? Because he had a pride. a blind spot. Pride. Pride is something that you have that you can't see. <laughs> it's, the, it's the pride is the broccoli in your teeth. <laughs> that you it's the spot on your clothes that you can't see, but your spouse can. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> something got stuck in my throat, y'all. <laughs> but you know that does go both ways. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. It goes both ways, brothers. brothers. But anyway, I'm trying to help the brothers out. Because all the women are saying that. Preach, Pastor. Preach that thing. Oh, yeah. I told him that just yesterday. Church, here, here we go. Here we go. So... So, pride causes self-exaltation and eventual fall. And of course, you know what happened with David. Once he, once he uh, realized from uh, Nathan the prophet that he's the one that did that, then he repents. Then he repents. And you know something about God, uh, he'll let you repent and he, you know, he, he receives that repentance. But you gotta understand that there's the law of mercy, but then there's also the law of soul and reap. Wow. It's like like parallel tracks that working together at the same time. God will forgive you, and He'll have mercy upon you. But then again, you can't break that law of soul and reap. So here's what happened: God said, David, because you repented, once Nathan brought it to your attention, what like he repented on his own? Come on, somebody, you understand what I'm saying? Once Nathan told you, he repented. Because you repented, I won't kill you like you killed Uriah. Right. But because you killed Uriah and you sowed the seed of murder, that child that you had with Bathsheba, uh -oh. Consequences. My God. of your choices, oh. you, that child's going to die. You see? So, 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 church, what I'm trying to tell you is that uh, we all have pride. And number two, that the unbridled pride is very, very dangerous and destructive, right? Pastor's got to be some good news. This is the worst sermon I ever heard in my life, Pastor. This is, you just, oh my God, it's supposed to be Christmas. Why are you talking about the angels and stuff? I mean, please, what was Mary and Joseph about? Good God Almighty. Well, point number last. We must understand that the cure, there is a cure for unbridled pride, and it is humility, and it works every time. Let's look at the scripture. Let's look at the scripture. First Peter 5, 5 says, likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed. In other words, put on the clothing. See, be clothed, it means you've got to actually, willfully, intentionally, voluntarily, mindfully put it on. It's not something that you just, you gotta, you gotta do this on your own. Put on, be clothed with humility. Somebody say, put it on. Put it on. For God, listen to this, resist the proud. That's why I don't worry about the, 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 the egomaniacs out there. I don't worry about them. They gotta deal with God. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I don't know about you, but grace is the omnipotent power of God working on behalf of the believer. Grace is the sufficiency of God working on behalf of the believer. Grace is the favor of God. And if you want to get some grace, all you got to do is humble yourself. 
when you're wrong, you just, just own up to it. Did you notice in here, don't think that I'm just telling you this because I want you to humble yourself to me. It says, it says all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Do you realize that this scripture right there, now listen to me very carefully, I'm almost done. This scripture right here describes something that I really want to leave you with perhaps the most important thing that I want you to take away uh, today, and that's this. That scripture implies church. That scripture right there implies church. In other words, in order for church to work, because church can be a great thing, when you get a whole lot of people believing together, a whole lot of people praying together, you, we, they, we can move mountains. We can do a lot of things, church. But I'm here to tell you, I'm here to tell you, no matter what church you go to, it's never going to be perfect. As soon as you get there, you just brought to me perfection. <laughs> no, but everybody in there is imperfect. Everybody, everybody on the side of my voice, we're all imperfect people. Yeah. And guess what? At some point, it's just the way it is. At some point, we're going to offend one another. Yeah. You know why? Because we're all imperfect. And here's what, here's, here's, what, here's, what, here's what happens. I'm wrapping it up. Somebody say he's wrapping it up. Wrapping Somebody up. say he's on his second closing. All right, see, so, so, so here's the thing. Here's the thing. Uh, in church, because people know that church is people and not the building, and that the people are imperfect, there's three types of people. There's three types. Number one, there's the people who recognize that church is imperfect, and they say, and there are three, three types of believers. There are the people who say, I'm a believer, but church is imperfect, I'll pass. I'm not going to church. I love Jesus. I ain't going to church because them people are perfect. I'll just stay in my house and, and be in my uh, false perfectness because there's nobody else around to you know, tell me any, any otherwise, right? So the first type of person is, I love God, but I ain't going to church. Because if I go to church with those imperfect people, somebody's going to hurt me. Group number two, I love people. I, I mean, I love God. I know that church is imperfect, and I'm going to go to church. But I'm not going to get that involved. In fact, those are the people that love the mega churches because I'm going to go to church, and I'm going to sit as far back as possible. And they got the big old monitors, the big old screens, and I can see the pastor's face up there, but I'm not going to, you know, it's, it's not going to be like Cheers where everybody knows your name. I'm not going to know people's names. I'm going to just get in and get out and, and, and drop my offering and get out. I'm not going to get too involved. And by the way, I'm not going to serve in the church because if I serve in the church, that's contact. That's human context with some imperfect people. Somebody's going to hurt me. And then there's the third kind of person. They love God. They know that there's an imperfect church. But they, they say, okay, I'm going to serve. And they do serve. And guess what happens? They do get hurt because people are imperfect. You know, it goes both ways. Sometimes, sometimes it's the person thinking that somebody else did something wrong and other times it's a person just being overly sensitive. But be that as it may, they feel, I got hurt. But here's the thing. But they don't follow the scripture of what God says you're supposed to do when you get offended. It's Matthew 18. And what God says, when you get offended, don't you just store it all up inside of you. Don't you just go around telling everybody, yeah, you know, uh, Brother Weber did this. He offended me. I was really hurt when he did that. No, you don't, you don't do either one. You go to your brother. You go to your sister. And in love and in prayer, 
you talk it out, work it out, and if you can't work it out eventually, then you go to the pastor and you work it out. What am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you simply this. Pride will keep you outside of the will of God. It'll keep you away from church. It'll keep you serving in church. And if you get hurt, it'll keep you doing the right thing to the people, with the people in the church. You know, and the pastor's not exempt either. I'm not exempt because guess what? I, I, there are things that happen all the time. In fact, if I'm to say I'm not exempt is an understatement. My, my wife and I, we've had people leave the church uh, because of things we just preached. We have people to leave the church because they said, Pastor, you didn't say hi to me today. I didn't even see the person. You understand what I'm saying? What, what I'm trying to tell you is, what I'm trying to tell you is, the, the word of God says, when you got a problem, put your pride aside and go to your brother, go to your sister and talk it out and work it out with them and be a person who's humble enough to say, I'm sorry that I offended you. Please forgive me. Now, you may not, not have intended to, but if the person tells you that they offended you, I'm so, that's humbling, huh? To tell somebody that you that you, you you're apologizing. You know, years ago my wife would say to me, she said, I'm, I'm not gonna say I'm sorry, because I ain't sorry. Don't 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 misunderstand the point. No, no, no. You, you gotta understand my point. You gotta understand my point. Not I'm not sorry, meaning I'm not uh asking you to forgive me. In the in when we grew up in the hood. We'd say somebody's sorry, like that's that dude right. is sorry, or that girl is sorry. You understand that, that kind of sorry. I'm not a sorrowful person, sorry. Apologize. Yeah, apologize. She would apologize. She would use what she doesn't like the word sorry. She would say, I apologize. Not I'm sorry. That's like I'm a sorry person. She didn't like that. But my point is this. My point is this. Do you realize what it takes to have to tell somebody you sorry? even though you don't think you did anything? People call it being the bigger person. Actually, it's being the spiritual person. That's what it is. It's just, just what God said. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you think for one second that me as a pastor, that I'm above that or whatever, you'd be surprised at all the stuff over, over these years. I've been pastor for 20 years now. All the stuff over the years that people... Uh, have had offenses about, and I will say to them, forgive me, I'm, I'm sorry, I apologize, please forgive me, even though I didn't feel I did anything wrong to them, but they were offended, and that's the right. scripture tells me that's what I have to do, and vice versa. Church, what am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you simply this, and listen very carefully, and this is my last closing. I'm trying to tell you this. This is the third. See, I was working on the third one. That was how you do it. Preachers go one, two, three. This is my third closing. And if I offended y'all, please forgive me. I'm sorry. If you felt if you felt this was too long, please forgive me. But listen, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I need you to understand this most important point. God is in the perfecting business. Y'all hear what I'm saying? We're not perfect. We are perfectly forgiven. That's what happened at the cross. But we're not yet perfect because we're still in flesh. But while we're in this flesh, he's in the perfecting business. And there's three ways he perfects you. He perfects you by the word. He perfects you by his spirit. But guess what the third way is? He perfects you by the fellowship of the imperfect saints. And when you, when you, disassemble and, and run away from church, you're actually missing out on God and missing the opportunity for God to, to shape you into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. You're running away. They hurt me. Well, did you ever talk to them about it? No. Guess what? You just sinned. Because Matthew 18 says, it says it. Read it. That's homework. Start in verse 15. Read it. It will tell you. You have to go to your brother and you have to say, hey, have, have, have you and I always uh, agreed on everything? Mm, pretty much. Pretty 
much most things. Have we ever had any little wrinkle or something we had to talk about? Maybe once or twice? Yes. And you still here? Yes. Because <laughs> we, we talked about it, huh? Yes. Worked it out. Absolutely. We know we love God. Absolutely. And we humbled ourselves to talk about it with each other and make sure that we forgave one another. Is that right? Yes. yes. Church, that's, that's it. My time is up. I thank you for your work. Okay, God bless you. Amen. All right, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. This, this, uh, this was a perfecting message because what the church does...